I just hope that it is helpful to someone listening to understand you can do it the way that you want, regardless of what anybody else says. It's your life, your definition of success, your goals that you want to achieve. And if no one has done that before, why not you Mm -hmm. do it in the way that you want? You know, don't, don't try to be someone that you aren't. Yeah. Beautiful. And welcome to the Orchestrating Your Career podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca, Becca for short, and I'm a clarinetist who studied at the Eastman School of Music and then went to London to get my master's and PhD, both at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Having shifted pathways in my own life, I love hearing about the varied careers musicians can have and how they got there. And that's precisely what we're exploring in this podcast. As I sit down with music graduates to chat about their unique musical journeys, hear their hard-earned wisdom, and learn about how they're orchestrating their own careers. For this first episode of 2024, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Rachel Roberts, head of the new Masters in Music Leadership program, the third director of the Institute for Music Leadership, and director of strategic initiatives, all at the Eastman School of Music. Rachel received her bachelor's in flute performance and arts leadership program certificate from the Eastman School of Music before embarking on a remarkable journey taking her throughout the U.S. and other parts of the world, working for the League of American Orchestras, the Atlanta and Houston Symphonies, and New England Conservatory. In the midst of all that, she also found the time to get a master's in education from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and is currently pursuing her doctorate. It's fascinating to hear how her musical journey brought her full circle back to Eastman to serve in her current positions. A gifted storyteller, Rachel shares numerous anecdotes throughout the interview, strongly emphasizing the importance of building community and taking ownership of one's own career. As we follow along, it's clear how both play such indispensable roles in her own story. I so appreciate Rachel's willingness to dig into those turning points and to share some deeply personal experiences that I think will really resonate with you too. You're actually listening to Rachel and her twin sister, Sarah, with the SMR Trio performing the premiere of New Peace by Micah Bell. Stay tuned till the end of the episode to hear some more of that performance. And now let's get right into the interview. Hello, Rachel, and welcome to the Orchestrating Your Career podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for asking. Of course. No, I'm really thankful that you are willing to come on and also especially on this weekend out of all weekends because it's a really busy one. So at the time of filming, we are here at the Eastman School of Music and it is Meliora weekend, which is really fun. And that's basically like a homecoming kind of weekend, would you say? Kind of. Meliora weekend is a chance to welcome folks Mm. back for reunions. You know, it's my 20 year reunion, which is hard to yesterday, yeah. And it's also a chance to invite parents to come mm. to see their kids and, mm. and what they're doing, concerts and events. There's all kinds of stuff going on yeah. this weekend at Eastman. So. There's a lot going on. This is my first Meliora weekend as an alum, which is really, well, really fun. Thank That's you so, so much. Fun. Thank you. And you said it was your 20th. This yeah. is my 10-year class reunion, so it's a pretty significant marker for yep. both of us, yep. I would say. Definitely. (laughs) So it's a really fun time to be here. I'm excited to be here, but I'm particularly excited right now to be sitting down with you and to hear just more about your story, because speaking of Eastman, you started here, like you said, you studied here 20 years ago. You did your bachelor's degree in flute performance. Mm -hmm. I also studied here doing clarinet, but we didn't actually meet at Eastman. We met all the way in London at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama during the Reflective Conservatoire Conference. I was studying there at the time, and you came, I think you were actually working at NEC at the time. I was working at NEC, and that's right at the same time that I was accepting the job here at Eastman. That's right. So it was the end of my tenure at NEC, which was bittersweet Mm -hmm. in many ways, but the work dovetailed into what's happening here at Eastman and what I'm doing. So... 
much. Yeah. That conference was fantastic. And it, it was, was so fun to meet you there. It was. And I just think it's so funny how and when you connect with people mm-hmm. because here we are, two Eastman grads, but we meet on the other side of the pond in London when we're doing different things. And I'm so grateful that we were able to connect because a few years ago, I was able to come visit you yeah. and sit in on a class you were teaching and just hear more about the new leadership master's program that you lead here at the Eastman School. And then since then, you've also become the third director of the Institute of Music Leadership, which is incredible. So I think it'll be really interesting to hear how you went from studying here at Eastman all the way back around to come back to Eastman doing all of these incredible things now, but just hear about all those little stepping stones along the way. So I'm excited to dig in, but before all of that, could you just set the scene for us? Tell us how you got started in classical music, why the flute, and how it all began for you. Sure. I was raised in Iowa Mm. in, you know, my, my parents never went to college, but they loved music and they were active members in the high school band. They played in our town's community band. Mm -hmm. My twin sister and I grew up around music from before we were born, you know, in the band room always. And it was, I wouldn't say expected, but my sister and I always just had in our mind that we would be playing music of some sort. Mm. We first started with piano lessons. My parents believed that was important to start with a piano foundation. Mm. How old would you say you were? We were in kindergarten, so five or six years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And my sister saw saxophones being made on Sesame Street. Oh. And that's what she wanted to do and the whole wow. improvisation that went behind it. Yeah. She's like, oh, that's what I want to do. And she is. She's professor of saxophone right now teaching jazz and classical and doing all the saxophone things. Mm. And for me, I wanted to play the flute because of my mom. Oh. She was a flutist and it was shiny and pretty yes. and made beautiful sounds. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do. So oh. I picked the flute because of her, but quickly it evolved into so many other reasons why Mm -hmm. I love that instrument. Mm -hmm. And truly, I love piccolo too. Mm. And that's that's what I wanted to do. And I I spent time here taking secondary lessons with Anne Harrow. Yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal resources here at Eastman. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Could you talk some about how you got to Eastman? So what was the thought process behind music performance and how did you end up choosing here? Sure. There's so many stories and Mm. I'll try not to keep it too long, but stories are great. You know, my sister and I for our first 18 years were known as the Roberts twins Mm -hmm. and people knew we were Rachel and Sarah, but we both were so musically inclined and in so many of the same music circles, it Mm -hmm. was the Roberts twins or at the honor band again, or the Roberts twins, you know, doing all these things. And, and that motivation came from a big piece of support from our parents. They got married right after high school and, and had a great life, you know, but They always felt like college, a college education could provide something more Mm -hmm. in your life. And so we were raised hearing our parents say all the time, you can go anywhere with music. Mm -hmm. You can do anything with music. Wow. And we heard that and they provided us lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, they took us on the road and we grew up in... Southeast Iowa, very tiny town. So anywhere was a drive. Mm. And we had weekly piano lessons, weekly flute lessons, weekly saxophone lessons. By our senior year of high school, I think we were on the road seven nights a week between community band rehearsal, community orchestra rehearsal, Mm -hmm. taking lessons, doing competitions. You know, it was relentless, but it's all because of our parents Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the enthusiasm and support that they provided us. You know, they saw how much we engaged with music and they're like, okay, we'll do everything we can to make that possible for yeah. you. Yeah, that's amazing yeah. and so special and it makes yeah. such a difference. My parents were the same. I feel like 
a lot of the things you're saying I relate to, doing all of the competitions, the honor orchestras, the, you know, youth orchestras, the way that they committed. And so you said your mother was a flute player. Was your dad also yeah. in music? Oh, Yeah, my dad, um, I just shared, you know, recently passed away yeah, on so November sorry. 1st. And so we all are still struggling with of that. Course. But, you know, I appreciate so much every day mm. what both my parents did yeah. for my life. And, and my first gig was actually with my dad. Um, how special. He, he played drums and percussion mm. in high school and then in the community band. Mm. I think they they both had played over 50-some years in the community band. So my sister and I, that was our first gig. Yeah. And... Of course, they didn't need another flute player, but they were short on percussionists. So mm. my dad's like, come here, hit this bass drum. You know how to count to four. Dive right in. <laughs> Amazing. So my first gig was playing bass drum next wow. to my dad. Yeah, could have turned out so much differently. You could have gone it down the have. percussion route. Yeah, it could have. But, you know, <laughs> mm. I still have a love of percussion. Mm. And that is a really fond memory. And actually, in just going through some of my dad's stuff this last year with my mom, Mom, she found my first pay stub for a whopping $12 wow. for that gig, and <laughs> she kept rich. it. It's in a scrapbook somewhere, <laughs> Aww, but it's cool. really fun. Yeah. And, you know, it was a whole family affair for us. My mm. parents loved music. They still do. And my mom is playing in a couple different community bands mm. now and, and uh, playing duets with my old flute teacher who I studied with. And it's it's just very sweet to see the community community that music can bring you at any stage of your life. Absolutely. And my parents felt that from their time playing in high school and in the community band, and they just wanted to share that with us, mm -hmm. you know? So they made certain that our life was fulfilling in ways that were joyful. Mm -hmm. And for us as a family, the Roberts family, the Roberts twins, mm -hmm. it, it definitely was through music. How beautiful. That's amazing. Yeah. What a legacy for them to leave for you and your sister. So then how how did you end up here at Eastman? Yeah, I yeah. was just going to say I didn't yeah. finish that No, no, story. no problem. We, Like I said, we were on the road all the time mm. for lessons and, and other things. And we ended up finding instructors. We found a summer music camp, and then that turned into our private lesson instructors at Western Illinois University. Mm. That's in Illinois, in Macomb, Illinois, about an hour away from where we lived, and I studied with the flute professor, Gerald Carey, who is an Eastman alum. And so there when, you go. when I was at that time to look at colleges, conservatories, where do I want to go? What do I want to do? Mm -hmm. He had a couple recommendations, and I looked at some fantastic music programs and flute instructors in Iowa. And then I applied to a couple conservatories as well. And then I applied to Eastman, which is not a conservatory. You know, it's a part of the University of Rochester. Mm -hmm. So there is a really comprehensive education in addition to really intensive music training. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Carey spoke of how much he loved Eastman and his time here studying the environment. And, you know, I was just enamored with everything he was as and is as a musician. Mm -hmm. So I made the trip out here. My dad and I took the train. That was a whole ordeal. <laughs> um, a mess. There was like a 56 inch blizzard during my audition day weekend. Well, of course there was. <laughs> of course there was in Rochester and I, I won't get into all the details, mm. but it was a mess, and yeah. I cannot believe my dad. This was the first time he and I had taken a trip together solo wow. because Sarah had a gig, and so mom stayed at home with her to take her, mm. and our train ended up hitting a car that had stalled <gasps> on the tracks, oh and the woman had jumped out. She was fine, but by the time we got to the train station, you couldn't see out the window because the snow was piled up so high, Wow! and finally, yeah, I kept calling Eastman. They're like, oh, yeah, if you make it here tomorrow, well, whatever time you're here, you mm. know. So finally, some news camera people came to interview the stranded passengers. Yeah. And I I hated talking to strangers. I mm. like to think I've changed a bit. And yes, <laughs> you're very good at talking to everybody. Um, 
but my dad handed me 20 bucks and he said, if you really want this audition, he said, they're finding a way to get out and about around town. He's like, bribe them with a pizza. So, (laughs) and they said, we won't take your money, but can we interview you for the news? So I think we were on the news that night. I have no idea (laughs) what happened. And then they took us to the hotel. The next morning there was no taxi. So we were walking down (gasps) East Ave with all of our stuff. And my Uh. dad was just not having it. And so at that point, I'm like, oh, I'm never getting an Eastman. Mm -hmm. And I walked in with no stress whatsoever and played my audition and walked out. And and my dad said, well, I didn't hear you play. And I said, yeah. He's like, no, that that couldn't have been you. He's like, I've never heard you sound like that. Whoa. And I'm like, well, that was me. He's like, that couldn't have been. That had to have been the professor. And I'm like... (laughs) No, that was me. Aww. She did never flew it out, I promise. So anyhow, yeah, fast forward, it, it was a whole, no more train wrecks, but train delays. We mm. missed our connection in Chicago. We had to get on this other train that was an hour away from home. We called mom and Sarah. They picked us up there. And then dad was retelling this whole mess. There are so many other things that happened I'm that I'm sure. leaving out. And then on the way home, dad was retelling all of it. He was driving and ended up getting a speeding ticket five minutes from our house. He's like, you're never coming to this to the school. Day. And then I come to school and then fast forward 15, 20 years later, I'm back here again here. working here. So <laughs> it was meant to be. It was meant to be. Wow. So. That's crazy. But it's because of Mr. Carey that I'm here. Mm. Yeah, mm. Definitely. I feel like there are a lot of those kinds of stories where there's just so like there's just so much going on that actually by the time you get to the audition maybe that helps you get into a different sort of state of mind that you're kind of like not stressing about the audition because there's been all of these other stressors yeah. that have affected you that's so. exactly what happened mm-hmm. yeah and I didn't realize it or recognize it at the time yeah. but for sure that's that's what was at yeah. play which was great because then I wasn't stressed and I was relaxed and yeah. just played and you came here and it completely changed your life it did. Yeah. yeah. So your time at Eastman, could you share some of your thoughts about your career? What were your goals? What were you thinking for what you're going to do after you came out with your bachelor's degree in flute performance? Sure. I came to Eastman thinking, I want to play in an orchestra. So mm-hmm. I want to play piccolo. That's what I love. Mm-hmm. And quickly realized, you know, when you come from a small town in Iowa... It's like, cool. The world is your oyster. You could do all these things, right? I was a big fish in a pretty small pond. Mm. And then I get to Eastman and realize I'm a tiny fish in a really big pond Mm. of amazing people. And I had a phenomenal experience here playing flute, playing piccolo, chamber music, all the ensembles. I loved all of that. It's also a really interesting time for especially in our country, 18-year-olds to say, you need to make a decision on what your future is going to be right now. Mm. That's a huge thing to do. Yeah. And so I knew I loved music. I didn't know anything else that had been my life for 18 years. And I came here... I took a couple auditions. One was with the Syracuse Symphony. It was a sublist audition. Mm-hmm. The whole studio went. I ended up winning. And I'm oh like, my gosh. oh, well, okay, maybe there's something there, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so wait, when was this? What year were you in um, around about? Sophomore year? Wow, that's junior. quite early. Look at you. It was, it was early. I think that was sophomore because then junior year I took... Or maybe these both were your sophomore year. I took an audition for the Minnesota Orchestra. They had the piccolo position open. Mm. And that I did not pass on. You know? And it was the first time I had done that. Mm. I swear there was hundreds of piccolo players there. Sure. And it really forced me to think about, okay, how do I want to navigate? Mm. This is a career path. This is what it's going to take. Is that what I want to be doing? Mm. And for me, the answer was no. Mm. I love music. I love playing. I love performing. I love large ensembles. But I wanted to be in control of my own finances Mm. in a way, right? And have my own financial security. So 
I also realize that I love the behind the scenes work. Mm. You know, I talked about that community band. I was the librarian in junior oh, high okay. and all through high school. And then I, I had a new, I had my parents' band director my, my first year of high school. And then second, third, and fourth, I had another band director mm -hmm. who they both were fantastic. And with the new band director, Mr. Wilkins, I started doing things bit by bit, mm -hmm. so much so that I was basically an assistant to him. And mm -hmm. by the time I graduated, they replaced what I was doing with a full paid employee to help oh, wow. manage the band. <laughs> and, you know, I was involved with my wind quintet and helping to get things arranged and coordinated. And mm -hmm. I love that type of detail behind the scenes work, connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. So after those two experiences with auditions that I had, I saw some flyer or some announcement for the arts leadership program. Yeah. And I'm like, what is this? And, mm. you know, had some meetings and I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I'm here at Eastman. Yeah. Let's check this out. So I did. I mean, I still kept playing and performing and I give, gave 10 flute recitals when I was here, wow. one every semester, and then junior and senior year gave three a year. And oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I, I would always put together chamber orchestras and chamber things, and I loved that type of detail, and I loved performing. Mm -hmm. But I also really found a home with the material that was being taught through the arts leadership program. Mm -hmm. I was one of the first classes to go through it, and the... Um, yeah, it, it was just fantastic in terms of what I was wanting, and it gave me a direction for how I could use my creativity in a way that was really meaningful to mm -hmm. me and yeah. a, a pathway that I could see was viable for managing my own career, not waiting on whatever job might happen to be available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you talk more about the arts leadership program and maybe just a bit about what that is and what your experience was like on it? What were the kinds of extra activities and parts of adding that certificate to your degree? Sure. So the full name is the Catherine Feline Schaus Arts Leadership mm -hmm. Fellows Program. Mm -hmm. I think we shorten it to a lot of different things. <laughs> yes. So for this, I'll just say ALP. Yeah. That program has some coursework that helps introduce students to what the music business industry is, mm -hmm. like marketing or creating a website or writing a grant, financial management, keys to healthy music. How can you be a healthy musician? Mm -hmm. So you take some credits of courses, and I should say all of those arts leadership courses are free. They always were. They always will be free to students, so mm -hmm. it's not cost prohibitive mm -hmm. to take them as undergrads or grad students, which I love. Mm -hmm. So you take some bulk of the coursework, and then you have some internship experiences as well, and then some advising. You're also, as a, a fellow ALP fellow, able to apply for some special opportunity funds. So I attended the APAP conference, mm. the Association of Performing Arts Presenters mm -hmm. back in the day, which was really fun, introducing me to a whole other side of the industry mm -hmm. for the very first time. Mm -hmm. My internships was one with the Rochester Philharmonic. Okay. I worked in the operations and production. Mm -hmm. And then the other was with the Eastman Media and PR department wow. at the time. I had a summer internship with them. And then I received a postgraduate grant as well with the Montana Summer Music. So mm -hmm. the Ying Quartet and Eleanor oh, Freer. Incredible. It was so much fun. So this was a year after I graduated, but I spent two weeks in Montana with them, doing some teaching, uh, working with them as an intern to help with publicity, to help with some writing and communications, to help with some tour management stuff, mm -hmm. but then got to play with the Ying Quartet too, which was super wow. fun. And, you know, this whole program that they had created in the community of Montana really drew people together. Mm -hmm. And again, it just, music has this way of creating a sense of community. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And 
It's so interesting how it feels like these pieces were already starting to form from you, even from before Mm -hmm. you came to Eastman when you were doing your work as the librarian, and then you were able to find similar stepping stones while you were here at the school, not even really knowing that that would be available to you when you decided to come. At the time, I had no idea, Mm -hmm. because the program was just beginning, Mm -hmm. and now, certainly, it's in the admissions booklet, and and we've been after this for 27 years, right? But I was one of the first classes. Yeah. to go through it and I'm so grateful that I was here the right time at the right place and to be able to have the support mm-hmm. you know to to do this and I I look at Ray Ricker who yeah. was the first director of IML mm-hmm. and took classes with him and mm-hmm. now he and his wife Judy taught um, for the MA in music leadership mm-hmm. degree and, mm-hmm. and they both have been such wonderful resources since yeah. coming back to Eastman. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how much comes full circle, but I yeah. think of what it must have taken for Jim Undercoffler and for so many people before that. I mean, what's back in, in there here? Let mm, me get it. Please. Um, this is the original business of music course (laughs) was taught by um, uh, Ray Wright and these are all of his notes this is the very first course handwritten notes handwritten notes here's a class January 31st 1979 that Frederick Fennell gave to the students Oh, my goodness gracious. You know, and it's just so cool to go back through here. Mm. Ray Ricker kept this, gave it to Jim Dozer. Passed it on. And then Jim gave it to me. And so I I need to take it to the library. But I just love having this here and pulling it out and flipping through it sometimes, you know. And and Jim Dozer's name is in here. He had taken this class back Mm. in the day when he was a student. So, you know, I I found his name a couple times in here on sign-in list. And, Mm -hmm. you know, publicity director, preventer, service group, uh, talking about agents and and what does it mean to be in the field of music. So it's just really cool. Wow. But uh, that's all to say I'm I'm kind of transitioning topics. But Eastman has been after this idea of learning the music on stage, but what off stage can also help you. They've been after this for a long, long, long time. Mm -hmm. And if you think of George Eastman who founded the school, who really helped to build Rochester, he Mm -hmm. was the ultimate entrepreneur too, Mm -hmm. right? And not only doing his craft, but being creative, being imaginative, being innovative in ways that really made sense, but then investing back in a community. Mm -hmm. You know, he single-handedly built Bausch and Lomb and Eastman School of Music mm-hmm. and help with University of Rochester and RIT and the Med Center single-handedly. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you take the docent tour at the George Eastman Museum, mm-hmm. they they tell the story of one night he invited five or six people and handed them a check. And I forget what the amount was, but I uh, use Google to translate what that amount would be in well, today's yeah, dollars. Yeah, yeah. It was something close to like $2 billion, <gasps> billion with a B, wow. each to to start these things in Rochester, Gosh. you know, and and so I I often think of George Eastman and and what that meant for the community of Rochester, mm. and what that meant for Eastman in terms yeah. of it starting. And so to me, it's no surprise that the business of music <laughs> mm-hmm. course has been here since the seventies and, and these conversations going on since well before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's been a long time. It seems short, only 25 years to have, it's 27 years to have it formalized, Mm -hmm. but it's been going on a lot longer than that. Yeah, it's been in the very framework of the institution. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I I feel lucky I I found my way here as a student and never imagined I'd be back, but Mm -hmm. here we are and it's it's been very fun. Yeah. Before we get into what you're doing here, which is amazing. I can't wait to dig more into that. <laughs> but I'm just curious. So you're you're studying at Eastman, you're getting involved in ALP and getting all of these extra experiences. How did that then shape your career goals and aspirations? Because you were saying that you went into Eastman wanting to play in an orchestra. Mm-hmm. So as you were taking part in 
all of these other sides of the music business, what was happening to your own goals and what you wanted to do in the music industry? Yeah, they were changing. Absolutely, they were changing. And I I remember being here as a performance major and Mm -hmm. recognizing I was having those changes. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of hard some days when the school is really based on excellent performance Mm and I worked even harder as a performer to not let that show. Mm. I think one of the things that Eastman does is help students cultivate this mindset of curiosity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's what was happening within me because Mm. the more I got involved in one thing or another, the more curious I became to learn and figure out how does this resonate with me? How, what might I do? And And it was really those internships that I had with the RPO and Eastman Media and PR that helped me understand there's a whole wide field Mm -hmm. of what to do, things to do, ways to be um, engaged and and doing good work in communities, right? Mm -hmm. So I was with the RPO and um, had decided to move to Houston. Hmm. And my supervisors there said, oh, you should call this person, hmm. Roger Daly, who used to be the education director at the RPO and was then the uh-huh. education director at the Houston Symphony. Okay, I'm like, okay. So I emailed Roger and I said, hey, I'm moving to Houston. Do you have an internship? He's like, you are an ALP grad. <laughs> He's like, why don't you apply for this job? Wow. You're beyond an internship. And so he was uh-huh. the one that connected me to my first professional job with the mm-hmm. Houston Symphony. And to answer your question, it's, you know, it's a process. And I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but at, at the time, I was just looking at what doors are opening. Yeah. How does that match with my interests and where I'm at? Mm -hmm. And I also was still taking lessons at Rice University on the side. Mm -hmm. I was doing some accompanying on the side. Mm -hmm. So I was still in a very musical community, even though I was working in the administration side of of an organization. Mm-hmm. So I was still balancing those two things. And yeah. that's that's ebbed and flowed throughout the last 20 years, mm-hmm. which is just fine because yeah. you can't be 100% at everything all the time mm-hmm. when life happens. That's I'm, I feel so fortunate to have been here at Eastman when the Arts Leadership Program was coming up and, mm-hmm. and be able to take some of those classes and understand how does that fit my own story, my own narrative, my own interests that mm-hmm. had been showing up since that first bass drum gig with my dad at the community band, right? Yeah. 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 So this job at Houston, was that right after graduating from Eastman? Because I know then you went on to get uh, an education master's at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? And why did you decide you wanted to go do a master's in a non-musical subject? Sure. I auditioned for grad school. Mm -hmm. As a flute performance major, Mm -hmm. because I thought, okay, that's the track that I need to go. Yeah. And I could have gone a couple really great places, and then I was (laughs) waitlisted. They accepted one flute at Juilliard, and Mm -hmm. I was number two on the list. And I'm like, oh, you know? And I, I decided I can take flute lessons wherever I'm at. Yeah. I don't... I, I wasn't sold on immediately going into a grad degree for performance. Mm-hmm. Now, had I gotten into Juilliard, I probably would have, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because you don't turn that down. Yeah. Um, but I didn't. And I, again, all these experiences had caused me to really think about what do I want to be doing? Yeah. And I thought, okay, if I get in there, that's where I'm going. Otherwise, I'm I'm not ready mm-hmm. to just go into another performance degree yet. I don't think that's what I want to do. Mm-hmm. So I took the job at Houston Symphony. And sometimes you just need life yeah. behind you, right? I said in, in some ways it's kind of unfair that our culture expects 18-year-olds to make this decision. Yeah. And so for me, I needed more time in mm-hmm. life experience. And so I took this job at the Houston Symphony learned a lot about 
behind the scenes of running orchestras, the challenges, the exciting things, you know, Mm -hmm. everything in between. One of my mentors and colleagues there, Matthew Van Beeson, was the general manager at the time. He recommended that I check out this League of American Orchestras fellowship program. Uh He had gone through it. So I did and went to the interview experience and walked out thinking, well, there's no way I got that. Similar to Eastman. I was like, Mm -hmm. there's no way I got in there and then get a phone call. They're like, yeah, we'd Mm -hmm. love to welcome you as part of this program. Mm -hmm. So I did that and spent a year on the road. The program doesn't exist in the same shape as it did when I went through it. Mm -hmm. But when I went through it, it was basically like an apprenticeship. You went to Aspen Music Festival Mm -hmm. and ran one of the orchestras. So I ran the Academy Conducting Orchestra. Oh my gosh, just diving right in. Pretty much, head first. (laughs) And the programming was all done, but Mm -hmm. it was the operations administration of it, managing it for the summer. So I did that and then worked with the Detroit Symphony that fall and then worked with the South Dakota Symphony in January and February Mm -hmm. where it barely snowed that year (laughs) and then ended with the Atlanta Symphony Mm -hmm. working with them. So it was this whole year-long apprenticeship program, basically Mm -hmm. creating different projects, being mentored by the leaders of those programs and um, yeah. That was really fun, and I had a couple different options at the end, but decided to stay with the Atlanta Symphony, and the transition to higher ed and myself and and going back kind of stems from the work with the Atlanta Symphony. Mm. We opened a 12,000-seat outdoor amphitheater Mm. there, and I was the one helping to navigate the grand opening, the planning of it. And I had about 90 days to plan the grand opening in, and it took a lot of people. So it wasn't just myself. It Mm -hmm. was a lot of people, but I really helped to coordinate a lot of the things that happened. It was so much fun. Mm. The last piece was 1812 Overture, and there was 750 musicians at the very end. Oh, my goodness. It was the orchestra side-by-side with the youth orchestra, chorus side-by-side with the youth chorus, and then two high school marching bands came in and flanked the sides for... That is so epic. The very... I will never forget that sound. And then, you know, like cold burn, fireworks coming down on the stage, and it was so celebratory and so much fun. I remember, though, some of the musicians from the orchestra coming up afterwards saying, you did such a great job. I wish I could have helped you, but I only have a violin degree Mm. or I only have this. And it's like, I only have a flute degree right now. What are you talking about? And it was that moment that really clicked for me, the value of what Eastman provides its Mm. students, whether in the arts leadership program or just that creativity and curiosity, Mm. you know? To be able to figure out how to plan a grand opening Mm. with colleagues and and do that in 90 days, anybody has that capacity to Mm. do it. It's just how how do you put those pieces together, Yeah. right? So that's what kind of flipped my brain about more schools need to have programs like this. And so I, I, on my vacation the following summer, I called a friend and said, hey, can I sleep on your couch? I'm coming up to Boston. She's like, yeah, sure. Great. And I told her what I was doing. And, you know, I met with a bunch of different professors at different schools saying, I have this idea. More music schools need to have a program like this. Mm. Here's my experience. Here's the reasons why. But I don't think anyone will take me seriously. I only have an undergrad degree. Mm. And they all said, well, that's really cool, but we don't have grad programs that could help you with that. Mm. (laughs) And one of them said, that's really cool. We might have a program that could fit you, but we also recommend that you check out New England Conservatory Mm. because they're starting this whole El Sistema movement. Mm -hmm. So I had one day left in town. I picked up the phone and called the person that this faculty member had recommended and so I, I sat down and, and met with him, learned all about the El Sistema movement, mm-hmm. what that was. He's mm-hmm. like, so what are you doing here? And I gave him my pitch, mm. which I now have practiced seven times, <laughs> gave it to him. He's like, whoa, that's fascinating. He's like, you, you have to tell this to Tony. I'm like, 
who's Tony? <laughs> so he calls and he's there and walks me up to his office and it says president. And I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? <gasps> and uh, so I gave my pitch to Tony. It was a quick conversation. And I walked out thinking, well, that's a weird way to end this trip to Boston. Mm. And a couple weeks later, I get a call from Tony saying, so nice to meet you. We are starting a program exactly like what you're talking about. Would you be interested in applying for this position? Wow. And I thought, whoa, you're kidding me. Mm. So again, that curiosity and right place at the right time talking about it. Mm -hmm. And I practiced this pitch, you know, so I, I had it yeah. down what I was saying. And, and so I went through the interview and NEC um, hired me. I had 10 months to do research and development and, and then launch a program. Wow. And then I went back to school. <laughs> Gosh, I had not realized that all of this life happened before you went and got your master's. Yeah. But that's really cool that the life experiences, those are the things that really were inspiring you then yeah. to go on and and I guess learn more about this area of education and, yeah. and it sounds and leadership as yep. well. Yeah. And organizational development. Mm. And yeah, because I, I took a step back and it mm. was all this life experience looking at how orchestras work and, and what the successes are and what the pain points are and looking at music schools and, and what works and what the challenges are there and, and really taking a step back and looking at nonprofits as an organization, mm. looking at leadership and nonprofit. And so it was after I had a couple years under my belt at NEC, the, the professor who initially said, that's a cool idea. We might be able to help you mm -hmm. go check out NEC. Um, that was at Harvard Grad School of Education. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to him a number of years later when I was interested in mm -hmm. that program. I said, I don't know if you remember me or not. He's mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, what have you been, you been doing? You know? And so I, I applied for uh, program at Harvard Grad School of Education mm -hmm. at, I don't think it exists in the same way anymore, which is a bummer, mm -hmm. but it, at the time they call a special studies program, okay. which is kind of design your own coursework. Oh. What do you want to look at? Mm -hmm. And I made this whole proposal about leadership and organizational development and mm -hmm. nonprofits and, and put together a course of study that took classes at the ed school. Mm -hmm took classes at Harvard Kennedy School, and then they had a partnership with Tufts School of Law and Diplomacy, and I took a couple courses there, too, and, mm -hmm. and just loved it, you know, and there's trans transferability with all of this, even though it wasn't music based. I was going to ask, yeah. yeah, all of the education leadership, leadership things you were looking at were more general, not mm -hmm. specifically in music. Yeah. So then where did music come into play in what you were doing at that time? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a step back and first say mm. it was just so weird to be in a classroom mm. with no music and silence. I can't silence. even imagine. <laughs> my first week back in class, I'm like, wait, what's missing? There's no music. Because <laughs> my entire life and yeah. career, even if I wasn't performing, there was music all yeah. around, right? So that was really weird. Mm. And I, I still wasn't used to that. Mm -hmm. But... I incorporated music because all the projects, all the research that we had to do, you could direct it in any way that you mm -hmm. wanted. Mm -hmm. So I was taking these concepts and trying to apply it to music and nonprofit and yes. creative organizations. Yeah. So that's how it connected in. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, the concepts that I was learning, I would then bring back to um, my work and what I was doing at NEC. And it definitely played into the the teaching and, and the work here at Eastman, mm -hmm. which I didn't know at the time that yeah. was going to happen. But. Yeah, yeah. So you were doing this master's alongside yeah. your work at NEC. Mm -hmm. Gosh, you've always just had a million hats on <laughs> doing all the things. I'm so impressed. <laughs> it's crazy. It is crazy. So I really, I love this idea that you were inspired by the experiences that you got here at Eastman and wanted to develop ways of extending that to more people. So after coming out of this master's program at Harvard, what were your ideas of what you were going to do with all of this? No idea. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll put a little aside in here that when I finished at, at Harvard, 
well, prior to finishing, I saw this advertisement for two things. One, a socioeconomic and political research trip, Mm -hmm. and two, a teaching fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that's so cool. I help all these students with Fulbright applications at NEC. I wish I would have had that experience, Mm. right? And I had never traveled abroad that extensively Mm -hmm. before. And I saw these announcements. The applications were due like at 9 a.m. the next morning. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, oh. So I'm like, well, somebody has to get it. I may as well try. You know? So I stayed up an extra hour or two hours (laughs) and wrote the applications and hit submit and then went on and just kind of forgot about Mm it. And then got called the next week for interviews for both of these things. I'm like, whoa, that's cool. I ended up getting it. And there was 35 of us, I think, that went on that research trip and then six of us who were teaching fellows. Mm -hmm. And I took three months off of the work at NEC, trying to figure out, you know, I'm doing all this stuff at NEC. What does this mean? Mm -hmm. Am I going to stay in higher education? And then have this crazy experience traveling. We were in 10 countries in 90 days. And, you know, the socioeconomic and political research trip meeting with government officials, meeting Mm -hmm. with uh, heads of banks and major corporations, meeting with heads of NGOs and learning really about poverty and migrants and Mm -hmm. refugees and and, uh, folks who get caught up in the system. And yeah, just this huge juxtaposition Mm -hmm. of those with wealth and those without wealth. And so then I went to the teaching fellowship and I taught leadership week-long classes on leadership communications in a bunch of different countries, some of the same, some different ones, Mm -hmm. and met with students who were, you know, high school, college, clear through mid-career and hearing their stories of how they got caught in the system or how they're limited by one thing or another or Mm -hmm. how their companies want to give them education, but only the education that will help benefit the company. Mm -hmm. And I was just left with this whole mix of, There is so much need in the world. What are we doing? Yeah. You know, so much need, sometimes corruption, Mm -hmm. a lot of corruption, Mm -hmm. right? And it's like, this isn't just overseas. This is happening at home too. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's under my nose. It's just, I don't actively look for it every day. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, I came back and was having this really huge reverse culture shock. Yeah. Um, from all these experiences and yeah, I heard, heard a radio announcement from Mayor Marty Walsh on the local NPR station saying about this uh, initiative. He was then mayor. He's no longer mayor. Mm-hmm. Um, an initiative to eliminate the gender wage gap in Boston by oh. the year 2030. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. Hmm. That would impact me. Same week, I read an article by the BBC News that said, at the current rate of change, gender wage equity, equality, will not be reached for another 208 years. Oh, okay. Those don't fit together. Oh. I'm like, well, I'm going to be dead <laughs> um, by the time that happens. So, you know, I part of Mayor Walsh's initiative was to have free salary negotiation workshops mm-hmm. for women all mm-hmm. across the city. And I'm like, I'm going to sign up. Mm-hmm. And I went, and it was fantastic information. And so I signed up to be a volunteer facilitator. Wow. And trained over 850 women all across Boston. And I would sign up to do the places that are not the, like, really popular ones in Mm -hmm. downtown, but the ones that are on the outskirts working with all types of individuals and... um, women in communities that English is not their first language Mm -hmm. and they're looking, how do I make a life? How do I negotiate for myself? Right. Mm -hmm. And so in some way it was finding a way to really connect in and give back and create that sense of community. Yeah. Um, and that does not at all connect with music, but it connects in another way that's just how how can you help with a better humanity yeah. and a better world? And if you have something to give, how can you engage with others and, and help encourage them and give them inspiration for yeah. what they can do? Yeah, and this idea of community, you've been talking about it from the very beginning yeah. of how you got started and, and how music was kind of what really it started a lot of that for you. And so now it feels like then you're 
you've been like extrapolating that out into other areas of life, even if it's not related to music. Mm-hmm. And just, yeah, like you're saying, just being able to contribute to larger society as a whole, mm-hmm. which is so important and really inspiring to hear how you've been taking those opportunities all along the way in trying to do that. Yeah. So you were doing all of this while you were working at NEC. And while you were getting your master's? Well, I had finished the master's, okay. and then I took three months off of my job. For the trip. For the trip. Mm-hmm. One month vacation and two months unpaid. Mm-hmm. It was just like the summertime. Mm-hmm. And then I came back and was trying to figure out, well, what do I do now? I have this education. Yeah. NEC was going through some see, leadership changes at the time. I got involved with this thing. And I was really trying to figure out what is next, mm-hmm. you know? I think it's always an evolving question. It just matters where are you in life right now and what are those opportunities that are open right now. Mm -hmm. But I I saw this position at Eastman Mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, that's so cool. They're starting a grad degree. Yeah. I I could never be hired as a faculty member. This is what you always think, Rachel. I know. I could never do this. And then you get... Because I had never been a full-time faculty member and Eastman School of Music. Yeah. Right? I can totally... I mean, I I relate because this yeah. is how this is how I feel like we all feel. Yeah. You can never get it. But I feel like there's an important lesson even when you feel that you go for it anyways and then look what happens. Yeah. Well, I will say it's also thanks to some friends who mm. said, Rachel, you should really check this mm. out. And the fourth time somebody <laughs> told me that, I'm like, okay, fine, <laughs> I will. And so I did. And it was a long process. Mm. You know, higher education sometimes moves slow, mm. but it was a long process with a happy ending for yeah. me. And it was then a whirlwind. You know, I, I came back and the MA in music leadership degree began in June of 2018. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I taught five of the 10 required courses. Mm-hmm. And so there was like a skeleton outline of the syllabi, mm-hmm. but taking that and making it into fully fledged graduate degree courses was a pretty mammoth undertaking to yeah. do that. But it was so rewarding and so much fun. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, okay. One year under my belt, I'm getting ready for the next year. Well, then COVID happened, Uh and it was emergency remote teaching. Mm -hmm. And then decided to, um, and this was in the works from the beginning, to change. Uh, I was getting so many inquiries from individuals saying, I'm interested in the degree, but it's, do you offer it online? Mm -hmm. I don't want to leave my family. I don't want to leave my job. I'm like, well, I get that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done part-time schooling and... Mm -hmm. And this is a really unique degree. So, you know, then we revamped all the curriculum to be online only delivery and got that approval through New York State. Mm -hmm. So that was three years. And then my fourth year here, Jim retired. Mm -hmm. So I backed off some of my teaching Mm -hmm. and stepped into this role and tried to fill his shoes, Mm -hmm. tried to fill Ray's shoes. And, you know, that's that's a big order to fill because they both had done so much for this department. Mm -hmm. And then Leslie left Mm -hmm. as well. She retired. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, this all is changing. And and then this year, my fifth year, I'm now in my sixth year. Yeah. So in, in April, I stepped into another role. My role expanded. So I still wear those two hats, but also am director of strategic initiatives mm-hmm. at Eastman. So mm-hmm. I work with the dean on helping to ensure things with the strategic plan are moving and, mm-hmm. and continuing. So that's an evolving role. No one's had that one before. So yeah. trying to navigate that and figure out what that means for Eastman, mm-hmm. especially now that Dean Rossi has announced his intent to step away from the dean position yeah. at the end of this year. And yeah. so I'm, I'm hopeful that all these things will kind of mix together in a way that is a benefit both for Dean Rossi while he's still here, but then also for the next dean that comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I really want to get into your roles here and the master's program. Mm -hmm. But before that, I'm just curious about the process of applying to this job. (laughs) And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that experience and maybe if you have any advice for people who, you know, who are coming from a musical background. I know that you've had a lot of on-the-job experience, Mm -hmm. but this is still, you know, a different step into a new role. How did you sort of navigate that, and what was the process like? Yes. (laughs) Um, For any 
college job, right? You have to have a CV. Mm. And I had never put one of those together before. Mm. I'd always just had resumes. Yeah. And I was still playing and doing some teaching and other things. I was at NEC Preparatory School teaching beginning flutists. Mm -hmm. I was playing with a fife and drum band in in Boston. I was doing some really fun, creative things. So that that music piece was still a part of my life. And and so I wanted to be certain that that was captured in Mm. my CV, too. Mm. I just felt that was important, especially being an Eastman alum and considering coming back here. It's like, I want to represent the musicianship that I still continue to Mm. have. And I'd say my CV was pretty non-traditional because I I had been guest teacher, uh, guest lecturer. I had co-taught a class before. I taught numerous, numerous workshops at different places, different schools, different summer festivals. Mm -hmm. But I'd never been a full-time faculty member. Yeah. Professor Roberts. Oh, yeah, I still giggle <laughs> when people call me that. <laughs> um, so for me, it was how how do I translate the things that I have done? Mm. How does that parallel what would be expected of a faculty member? Mm. So as a faculty member, part of it's recruitment, right? Mm. I could talk about relationship building. Mm. That's kind of what recruitment is. Yeah. Absolutely could talk about working with other colleagues administratively, what that would mean as a department and and looking at those goals and planning. So that translation was pretty easy. Hmm. But then the teaching piece, you know, I had to think really critically about what would my approach be to developing curriculum? Hmm. What is my approach to grading and assessment? What is my approach towards equity and inclusion, Mm -hmm. right? What is my approach to any of this. And I had thought about it on smaller scales before, but I had never thought about it large scale, Mm -hmm. not just teaching classes, but running a brand new program, academic program, I should say. So I put together my materials and I thought, well, maybe I'll get an interview. Mm -hmm. And, and I did. And I hung up. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no. Mm -hmm. And then they invited me here Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe there's something, Mm. you know? And (laughs) I had um, a lovely dinner interview meeting my first evening in, and it always just amuses me. They took me to a steakhouse, and I've been vegan almost 10 years now, and I'm like, okay. Oh, no. So just, like, push some stuff around on the plate. (laughs) Um, I understand. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> not going to make a big deal about yeah. it. Yeah. And just trying to really frame my mind about what do I want to represent? Who am I? Mm. And I don't think I've shared this story in any public format before, but, you know, as part of an interview process for any faculty, it's very typical that you give a public presentation mm. or teach a class or mm-hmm. something. So... I had to teach a class. I had numerous interviews. And the first one began that morning with four or five faculty members. And all of them I knew from being here as a yeah. student, right? And yeah. had loosely stayed in touch in different ways. And I will not name names. But one of them very kindly yet firmly asked, well, Rachel, you have never been a faculty member before. Mm. What makes you think you could be on faculty mm. at the Eastman School of Music? And I'm like, okay. Just right to the point. This is how it's going to be, yeah. you know, which is exactly what I had been thinking about. And yeah. they called it. And I said, you're right. I'm not going to tell you that I've done something when I haven't. Yeah. But here's what I have done. And here's how I see it translate. Mm into building curriculum. And here would be my approach for that. Mm -hmm. And here's why I think this is a really unique degree. And here's what I think I would have to offer in building it. Mm -hmm. Right. But it it was intense. Right. And the story that I don't think I've shared publicly before is that night, well, in, in the public presentation, it's, they gave me like a topic, right. Mm -hmm. And I had put together one presentation that I thought was everything that they would want to hear. Mm -hmm. And after that dinner, I thought, no, I have to represent who I am and what I believe. And so I stayed up until 2.30 that morning redoing the presentation. Wow. 
and framed it as here's the five big areas that I see that are challenges Mm -hmm. in, in life and in the world. And here's how musicians connect into it. Mm -hmm. And this is what arts, the arts leadership program has done for me. Mm -hmm. This is how I see music can help change the future but it's really hard questions and really hard topics. You know, mm-hmm. looking at um, access to water, mm-hmm. because at the time, I think, was it Phoenix was about ready to be out of water, and so was a major city in South Africa. Mm-hmm. With lack of water, then you can't produce enough food, right? But yet you look at our population, and by the year 2050, it's supposed to grow to like 9 billion. That's like adding another China and India to the world. And so if you don't have enough food and water, how can you sustain the population? Mm -hmm. And with that comes huge economic diversity Mm -hmm. and only further heightens those that have and those that have not. And that impacts education, that impacts everything yeah. else. You look at how technology factors into that. So that was my presentation. Mm. And I got done and nobody knew what to do with it. There was no response. Oh, And somebody piped up and said, so does that mean more benefit concerts? <laughs> and I said, well, it could be, but But it's beyond that. It's how do you really integrate arts and leaders into a community, into society. Yeah, Mm -hmm. in a way that can help address these challenges because this is some, uh, we're educating students right now who will have to face these problems, Mm -hmm. right? And so these are some of the conversations that are brought into the music leadership classes and degrees and projects. And Mm -hmm. there's no one right answer. It's definitely not solved. You look in the news every day. Yeah. But I feel like, I felt like, For that interview, that was a way that I could represent myself, both with the work that I had done at Harvard and traveling overseas in Southeast Asia with music and communities and other things. And, and, you know, again, I walked out of Eastman. I'm like, no, I didn't get that job Mm. because there was no (laughs) reaction. And I'm like, wow, okay, that that Mm. was bad. But at least I represented myself. Yeah. You know, and I guess it wasn't bad. It was just the narrative, you Mm -hmm. know, because it's so hard to know what other people are thinking. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. There are two things I've been thinking about as you've been speaking. And one of them is just that importance of showing up as your true authentic self and you, you know, redesigning your whole presentation at the last minute because you felt like, actually, I really want to represent who I've been for the last 10 years and bringing in all of these experiences from Asia and Mm -hmm. world experiences. And I just think, you know, maybe at the time when you're applying for a job like this, you wouldn't think about how an experience like that could be brought into it or relatable, but actually all of these things fit and connect into, you know, your, Mm -hmm. what you're, what you're making your career to be. And the other thing I was just thinking was the importance of this question you were posed at this interview and how you hadn't ever been a faculty member and yet you're applying for this, you know, to, to start a whole new master's program at the Eastman School of Music is a really big deal. I could completely understand not feeling equipped or not feeling like you were at the level of, you know, maybe if I taught at another institution, if I got some experience under my belt in that specific realm, then I could apply for this job. But the fact that you, like, that you still went for it and that you were very upfront about, you know, like you said, I can't tell you I've done things I haven't done, but this is what I have done and this is how it does apply. And I think that's really helpful because I think a lot of times people can pass up opportunities because they don't feel that they're ready or they don't feel that they're prepared. But actually, if you, like you did, think very thoughtfully about your experiences and how they can relate and how you can show, actually, this is very similar to this other role in the job, even if on paper it doesn't look exactly the same. Right. Right. And it requires of you... Uh, humility and a mm. reflective practice. Yes. Right? Yeah. To really check in with yourself and say, regardless of what anyone else wants from me, 
what do I want for myself? Yeah. How do I see this work contributing? Mm-hmm. Do I really have the skills and qualifications that could transfer into this? Mm-hmm. Right. And I had a couple long conversations with some, some good friends about that before I decided to apply. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's important to have that network of trusted colleagues, of trusted mentors to really help you help me reflect and say, what, what can I do and what really would be a stretch? Yeah. You know, Mm -hmm. and that's been something I, I have a, a group of four other women, the five of us met during that league of American orchestras program. Mm -hmm. And we are really great friends and really great you know, trusted colleagues and support and, and can help each other honestly navigate through mm-hmm. challenges personally and professionally that come up. And, and since COVID, we've connected almost weekly. Mm-hmm. We started a weekly Zoom chat again, and we've seen each other once a year, at least once a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we find a purpose or a reason to get together for a weekend somewhere and mm-hmm. just have our own little retreat and talk about all kinds of things. And we had had monthly calls on and off throughout that time. But since COVID have really reconnected in a different way. And I just bring up that as a value of, again, community, Yeah, finding your own community, but finding people who you can really trust and mm-hmm. be honest with, and they can be honest with you. Yeah. And I remember when I was thinking about applying to this job, I, I passed it off for so long. I'm like, no, no, I'm no way I could be a faculty member. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and they helped me think through how I might prepare for those questions. Yeah. They helped me think through, would I, could I make that case mm-hmm. for what have I done and how would it translate? Mm-hmm. Right. And sometimes, you know, looking from the outside, it, it can be very much, what you see is just one person making these decisions. Mm -hmm. But I bring this up because it's really important, again, to bring up that sense of community and that you are never alone. Yeah. You're never alone, right? There's always, I hope, there's always somebody that you could call or at least an intro into um, so that there's multiple resources, Mm -hmm. you know. And that's what I would hope for anyone. Yeah. And especially coming from Eastman, Alumni Weekend, Mm Meliora Weekend, things like this, it's a really great chance to network and 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 reconnect reconnect and and you never know where those connections will lead but Mm -hmm. I know if I pick up the phone I'll get a call back yeah you know and that's so important for all of us to be able to have Mm -hmm. and so I I know there's a couple that I lean on really hard with that Mm -hmm. And that's why when somebody calls me, it's like, I try to do that same thing because yeah. you never know the meaning that that will have in someone's yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I just love the idea of, as you've been saying over and over community and how you've been fostering it at all these different levels. So at the smaller intimate level with your friends and close mentors and confidants that can help you, but then also at the larger levels of society and all those steps along the way. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. And I feel like your story shows just how important that is and the impact that it's had on you. And, and so then encourages all of us to think more about the communities that we're fostering for ourselves at all these different levels. Yeah. Mm. Very cool. Could you talk now about the master's leadership program at Eastman? It's such an exciting program. It's been really cool. Even just hear you talk a little bit about it, like all the different ways that it's been evolving for you personally over the last six years. But could you talk more about what the program is and what you're doing with it? Sure. So I have to give a huge shout out to Jim Dozer because Mm. he did the heavy leg work with all of it Mm. in getting everything passed and approved through here at Eastman and then through New York State. Mm. I was just brought in once all that heavy work was done to Mm. actually teach and uh, do that. So I just want to give a huge shout out to him for that and for so many other things. Jim's amazing. (laughs) He's amazing. So the MA in music leadership degree is now a fully online degree Mm -hmm. that helps musicians 
with the skills that can help them be successful both on and off the stage. Mm -hmm. If a student chooses to pursue this full full time, it's a 14-month degree, so a summer full academic year and a second summer. Mm -hmm. Part-time could be anywhere from two to five years, depending on where you are and what's going on in your life. And the program, I like to think of it in three different pillars. The first is the traditional arts administration skills Mm -hmm. with marketing, finance, all of those things, right? The second is continuing to develop your musicianship skills Mm -hmm. in one way or another. This is a program for musicians. It's at Eastman School of Music. So what does that mean? For students that choose to study here in Rochester, they can take any, most any of the electives here Mm -hmm. at Eastman, secondary lessons, chamber music, music theory, music history, all of those, so so many things Mm -hmm. here. For those that study online, it's a bit more limited, but Mm -hmm. we still have secondary lessons that are online. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of really unique independent studies, Mm -hmm. connecting with faculty members online in in different ways. Um, And some... Occasionally, some of the classes are still taught online Mm -hmm. after COVID, and we have some other electives through the arts leadership curriculum Mm -hmm. that students continue to develop their own musicianship in ways that are important to them. So that's Mm -hmm. the second pillar. And then the third pillar is looking at leadership. There's a couple courses that tackle this head on. You know, Jim Dozer still teaches leadership issues in Mm -hmm. music. That's a phenomenal course hearing from six or seven different leaders in the field Mm -hmm. about challenges that they've navigated, what they've seen, how they approach it. There's a course that I teach in the spring, Creative Innovative Leadership in Musical Arts Organizations, the long title, Mm -hmm. that we use primarily the Eastman case studies Mm -hmm. to analyze challenges. We have a ton of other readings to try to understand multiple layers of leadership mm-hmm. and then reflective practice, mm-hmm. right? How, how do you look at your own leadership, but then how do you analyze leadership in an objective way? So the students actually have to write their own case study on leadership mm-hmm. for that class. And all the classes have reflective leadership components brought in in, in a variety of different ways. We work on developing communication skills, written and verbal communication skills. That's important as a leader. (laughs) That's important as an advocate. Yeah. The cohort, you know, we try to keep anywhere between 10 and 20 Mm -hmm. because we want to have that individualized support for every student that comes in. Mm -hmm. And so far we have been able to do that. and, And that comes in through mentoring, through getting to know each student, through building a community. There it is again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> building a community, even though the degree is online, we have virtual hangouts or networking events mm-hmm. a couple times a semester. And with the coursework, it's all taught online. There's synchronous meetings every module, and mm-hmm. there's asynchronous work that the students do themselves. Mm-hmm. Yet oftentimes that work requires collaboration and connection. Mm-hmm. And, and so they're building this really amazing learning community together. They're co-constructing that as they navigate through each course and through the entire degree. Mm -hmm. The very last piece, once all the other curricular components are done, is the capstone. The capstone can either be a really intensive independent study or a high-level internship Mm -hmm. with an organization. So some of the independent studies, one has put together a business plan for how to open a community music school. Another did really intensive research on equity and inclusion in uh, different performing arts organizations, and that led to her having a new job that was mm. created at the League of American Orchestras. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And the internships students have taken on, the goal is for them to take on a project in the organization so they can put their ideas into practice, but still be mentored and mm-hmm. oversaw by the leadership of the organization, mm-hmm. as well as just to get their feet on the ground, right? Mm-hmm. And, and see everything that's going on. All the experiences have been so wide ranging based on their own interests. Everything from 
the Bang on a Can Festival at Mass Mocha, huh. to Street Symphony in LA, to Aspen Music Festival, Interlochen. We had a student whose passion is in theater, so we found a theater organization here, and, and her placement was mm-hmm. actually working with tribes in Tanzania. That's some of the work wow. that they did. So, you know, we really try to find very unique experiences and yeah. one where it's a benefit for the host. Mm -hmm. but it's also a benefit for the student in areas that really interest them. Yeah, it sounds very personal. It is. And while it's not an expectation by any means, we have had three placements, three host organizations actually create jobs for our students Mm -hmm. to offer them full-time employment once they finish this. So that's been really awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was listening actually to a video that you did talking about the program. It's very extensive, really in depth. So I'll actually link it in this video because it's, yeah, such an interesting program. And something that really struck me was just how experiential it is and how important it is that you're getting basically on the job training. It seems like you're actively getting involved in these things, almost like you were working in those jobs or positions. What was kind of the thinking behind that and how do you feel that's different from maybe other other programs master's programs yeah Yeah. it was very intentional to Mm. design it that way Um, but there's so many theories so many practices out there of you know how how do you educate all of these different topics and we wanted to approach it specific from a musician lens being at Eastman and that is an MA in music leadership. Mm-hmm. So that that was important. But the other piece that was, I think, both from my own interest and, and perspective and from those who teach in the degree too, there were so many conversations that, oh, I wish we would have had this before we started out in our careers. Yeah. And all of us took the approach of, yes, we can teach the theories, we can teach the readings and the concepts, but let's just design activities that you would Mm -hmm. find in any professional arts organization so that when you walk out, the marketing plan that you have, you could use, you Mm -hmm. know, you have experience building a marketing plan, you have experience, a little bit of experience Mm -hmm. with strategic planning, you know, the fundraising course, I initially taught that. I don't anymore with these job transitions, Mm -hmm. but my, my first ask that I ever did solo for anyone asking for a donation Mm -hmm. was asking for a $6 million gift. (gasps) And I had no preparation, no one to guide me. Mm -hmm. I kind of went on instinct. I went on what I knew. Yeah. I ended up getting it. Wow. And then it was redirected. That's a whole story. I, I won't even go into that mm-hmm. right now. But in teaching that course, it's like, I don't want any student to walk out of this degree not having asked for money mm-hmm. and not knowing how to prepare for doing that. Mm-hmm. I don't want anyone to walk into having, A, to make an ask for $6 million unprepared, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? And it's so it comes from all these life experiences yeah. of here's what would really set you apart if you had these skills and experiences. Mm-hmm. So even though I don't teach the course, Tony still kept it in that a piece of it is preparing for and actually making an ask. Now it's a fictitious ask. We don't expect them to give the $25,000, but mm-hmm. we have students actually go through all the preparations and the background. And, and there's been a couple times where the individuals have said, yes, I would all, all class projects aside, I will donate to this because I, you know, that is so cool to have Mm. that experience. So as much as possible, we're trying to replicate what is found in the professional world so that students are walking out ready to go, you know, and I'm, I'm so pleased that we have really almost a hundred percent job placement within three months of graduation. And these students, all of them, every class year have been amazing. Mm -hmm. They're going out in the world and doing these really cool things. And I just can't wait to sit down in another 10 years, Mm -hmm. you know, and see where they're at. It's it's only five years now. It's Mm -hmm. still a very young program. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are in our sixth year at the moment, but it's, uh, 
they all are incredible. It's just yeah. a really very diverse mix of community. We have folks who come right from undergrad mm-hmm. and those in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s wow. are part of this program. So just the life experience that that brings with them. Mm-hmm. Also, the, the motivation for why they want this education at this point in their life. Yeah. It's such a cool community. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, just so proud of who every one of these students are and and what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting to hear. I know that we are when we are talking about your application for the position and how, you know, you hadn't been a professor before, but actually, I mean, I can understand why Eastman would have selected you because it feels like you're so uniquely qualified for this role and all I can see, you know, all of these life experiences that you've been sharing this whole time and how they come into play and how they've influenced the makeup of this program. And you're talking about making experiential things and the things that maybe you felt you had to go into not feeling as prepared as you would have wanted to. Mm -hmm. Now you're offering that Mm -hmm. to students so that they can be prepared. I think that's so special, so cool. And as we were saying, it just really it so brings your story full circle because you're just offering to younger students now, or I mean, you know, older, but Mm -hmm. people who are maybe in their career behind where you were, you're just offering to them what you wished you could have had Mm -hmm. at that time going into all of these, you know, going into this world that we live in. So, and then this new piece or a couple of new pieces that you've added Mm -hmm. these positions of now being the director of the IML and then the initiative for strategic yeah director of Eastman strategic initiatives Eastman strategic initiatives how do those play into what you do here how is you are saying you scaled back a little bit in terms of teaching for the master's leadership how has your position here evolved and changed with those new additions yeah Well, first, thanks for all those kind words. That's very sweet. There was no way that I could still teach five of the 10 classes with all of these other things. So I teach 10 credits, four in the summer, three in the fall, and three in the spring. Mm -hmm. So I'm still very active in teaching and in knowing who the students are and how they navigate classes, which I, I love. I want to stay with that. And... Yeah. First, the IML director role. I mean, you were a part of ALP. Mm-hmm. You know Jim. Yeah. And I don't know. Do you know Ray Ricker, too? I mean, I, I yeah. come across him. I've yeah. seen him. So the two of them are just incredible humans. Yeah. You know, and the work that they have done to get IML to where it is, is tremendous. Mm-hmm. So I think of them every day when mm-hmm. I walk in here. You know, the work that it took for them to to get IML where it is in the school, in the community, the broader educational community. And I try to carry that forward. Yeah. You know, things are changing in the world. Things are changing in higher ed. Mm-hmm. But I still think of the passions and the motivations that they had in leading the department. And I, I try to, I use that as inspiration every day to try to figure out, okay, where's IML going next? Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Yeah. So that's been really fun. Mm. You know, there's a lot of great things that we're doing in IML providing for current students, investing in them, whether it's classes or grants or advising, all of these things. But then we're really looking to expand our our leadership programs to others in the community, local and national. Mm -hmm. We have our Eastman Leadership Academy, which we moved online during COVID. That's really for college students. Mm -hmm. It's all online, a week long, dipping your toe into the water of of music leadership, right? Yeah. Our boot camp is more for early to mid career professionals in music. Mm-hmm. That's all online. That was we just finished our second year for that. And we structure it so that if you have a full time job, you hopefully don't have to take too much vacation off. It's mm-hmm. an extended lunch hour and then an extended evening. Mm-hmm session for a full week, diving into some of the main themes and and topics that we cover in the MA in Music Leadership degree. So it's, again, a week-long intensive experience. 
our Eastman Leadership Conference is really for higher education professionals looking to take that next step in higher mm-hmm. ed. We've kept that one an in-person conference for a variety of reasons, uh, but we just finished summer number, I think, summer number seven. Wow. Is that right? Well, six because of COVID. We, yeah. we didn't do one yeah, that yeah. one year, but yeah. And that's building a really awesome community of professionals in higher ed that still stay in touch with one another, mm-hmm. which is so fun to see. Mm-hmm. And then just a week ago, we had our first Eastman leadership development retreat, Oh wow! which was for high schoolers in the area. We oh. had a, a high school band conductor come to us earlier this spring and say, we hear you do these programs. Would you do one for high schoolers? Wow. It's like, okay. So, you know, colleagues here in IML kind of, we all did some research and connected with friends and, and colleagues at Eastman and said, okay, let's test this out. Mm-hmm. So we had just shy of 50 students here last Saturday. Wow. We had a day long something for them. I think, what was it? Nine to four. So it was kind of long, you know, we're processing the feedback, but it really was a deep dive into how do you create musical programs and engage with your community? What does that require of you as a leader, as a musician? What are skills that you can develop? It was for high schoolers. Yeah. How, can you imagine going I to something know, right? like that in high school? I know. I so would have loved yeah. that. So the feedback is really good. Mm. So I think we'll probably do it again next year. Mm-hmm. But we're looking at, you know, this was the test year. So how can we expand it to those in the region? Not just, I think we had like 12 different school districts represented in mm-hmm. the Rochester area, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. How can we expand it to the region? What's the right time of the year? What's the right time of day? Some people said maybe a bit shorter of a day. Some people said this needs to be three days long. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, yeah. How, how do we sift through that? Yeah. And uh, finding more partners and, and colleagues here at Eastman, do we partner with admissions mm. in, in doing this? Do we partner with some of the other faculty, like have a big networking lunch or something? Mm. I don't know. We'll have it figured out by next year and do round two. But between that and our podcast and the case studies that we're writing and producing, there's just so many different things going on. And and then with the Paul R. Judy Center, Paul Judy gave funding to really focus on research and what are the trends Mm -hmm. in, in music. So his gift helps support the case studies. It also supports a research center and we've restructured that a little bit. And we now have two or three students who are helping us do some industry research first on, on pay ranges and pay scales. So we can understand what that variety is Mm -hmm. to begin and what those opportunities are, mm-hmm. but then we're going to be diving into some other pieces. So hopefully, not hopefully, it will be online, hopefully by the end of the semester, the first piece of it, and mm-hmm. then we'll just continue adding to that. But we don't see that being put out in any forums right now. And that would be such a benefit, not just to Eastman students, but to the field at large. Yeah. So that's part of the reason why we are diving into that area mm-hmm. using the support from Mr. Paul Judy, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And we're really excited about that piece. So, yeah. you know, we're trying to look at what are the opportunities that exist and, and how can we create these for Eastman alums anywhere, mm-hmm. but also just be a resource to other musicians and creatives and administrators who seek some type of leadership development support. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many pieces to what you're doing. I don't know how you keep track of it. I have an Um, awesome team. (laughs) Yes. I don't do it alone. And the entire IML department is a fantastic team. That makes a big difference. And even just your assistant, Kelly, who helped set all of this up for us. Yeah. I mean, she's been incredible. She's amazing. Your team makes everything. Yeah. Kelly and Blair and Jeff and Christian and Harish, all of them. Mm. And we have a team of, I think, 14 student workers this year, too. 
know. So it's, it's, we do a lot, but there's a lot of people here who play very central roles Mm -hmm. in running it. And, you know, it wouldn't be as robust as it is now if it Mm -hmm. weren't for the whole team of IML, including our student workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've been holding this question for basically (laughs) Uh the whole interview because you've always had so much going on. I feel like at every step of your musical career, you always are just doing a billion things. So I'm just wondering, how do you balance it all? Because I know you also just recently got married. I did. Three months and four days ago now? Yes, today the sixth. Yeah, four days. (laughs) Good. That's awesome. You said yes. Yesterday, I three, did, three yeah. months and three days. So that was easy to yeah. remember. So congratulations Thank on that. You. So, I mean, you have a husband, a whole other life outside of all yeah. of this as well. How do you balance all of these different pieces? Yeah, there's no one right answer. Mm. And, and I will say, I'll tell this story too, which I've been starting to share a bit more. And I think it's relevant to share. Well, I don't know. You can edit it out if you want. That's fine. (laughs) I I think it's relevant because there is a large part of my life I just had the pedal to the metal and would go, 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 go and not take any time for myself, Mm -hmm. right? And then when COVID happened, I got a puppy, which Mm -hmm. was so much fun. I mean, it ended up being around the same time. I had been planning to get one at the end of the semester. I just scooched that deadline up since I'm like, I'm going to be at home. So Coco Bean is a sweetheart. And then during COVID, I... um, Yeah, I started a doctorate at Warner School of Education, so I'm doing that part-time on the very, very, very slow six-year track. I had seen that, and I, I I remember reading that in your bio, and I was like, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. On top of everything, she's also doing a doctorate? It's one class at a time. Yes. <laughs> so another three semesters of coursework and then the project. But yeah, and there was all kinds of societal things going on. Mm-hmm. And there was work here at Eastman that I was engaged in. And I was getting to a place I was not good at working from home and setting those boundaries, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think this had been a long time coming by long time, 15, 16 years coming, just go, 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 go. And, Mm -hmm. and sure, sometimes I do, but it was like all or nothing. Yeah. And then one afternoon I, I was downstairs playing with Coco and I had just fed her and I went to go stand up and everything blacked out (gasps) and I didn't pass out, but it took me a good five or 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm running, I'm wearing this watch, monitors my heart rate. My resting heart rate typically is in the 50s. It was dropping to the 40s and then the 30s. Oh. And it's like, I'm not that healthy. I mean, I'm <laughs> healthy. I'm, I'm not like that yeah. healthy though, right? And I had just passed off those symptoms. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, whatever. And I was getting dizzy when I was standing up. I'm mm. like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know? And then that happened. And I just happened to have a Zoom call with a friend, and she's like, how are you? And I'm like, I just had this really Mm. weird thing. She said, Rachel, you have to call your doctor. Mm -hmm. So I did, got an appointment the next day. They hooked me up to an EKG, and they said, you have to see a cardiologist right now. Oh, my gosh. I'm like, okay. So I got in the very next day. This was like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Walked out of the cardiologist with a heart monitor on. Mm -hmm. And had to wear that for a month and basically was having these erroneous beats every other beat. Mm. And so typically when your heart beats, there's an electrical signal starts at the top, pushes down. Mm -hmm. And mine, as soon as that was happening, was having one from the bottom pushing up. So it was working against itself. Oh, no. And I had noticed I had been sleeping more and more, like taking naps during the day. I was sleeping like over 12 hours a day and Mm -hmm. still not feeling rested. Well, that's because I couldn't exercise. I couldn't run. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I would get winded just walking down that block. It would take me five minutes to walk down that block. Wow. So I'm very thankful I was at home during COVID. 
and I could lay down and take a nap between meetings and mm. do all this stuff. And I uh, ended up, they figured out what that was, and I had to have a cardiac ablation. It was a five-hour procedure. I was awake for all of it. They were inside mm. of my heart mapping the electrical signals, and then they ablated or deadened <laughs> the electrical signals. So if you remember the game Operation as a mm-hmm. kid, that's what it felt like. And I didn't know that I could feel the inside of my heart until now. Until that happened and then feeling like the blood sloshing around and and feeling that I'll stop. And I journaled about it that day afterwards. It was Mm. just incredible. But, you know, I spent the night in the hospital and, and I'm like, what? The only thing that they could find that was the contributor that made this happen was stress. Mm. That's it. And okay. I, I, have stopped drinking. Uh, Not that I drink a lot, but I don't anymore because of this. Mm -hmm. I eat healthy pretty much. I've been vegan for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes I eat donuts or things, you know, the vegan kind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for a large part, and I run marathons, yeah. I hike mountains, I I think I'm pretty healthy. Mm. And if all of that still led to a cardiac ablation, which 40 years ago, they didn't have this procedure. 40 years ago, had I gotten this, I'd be dead right now. Wow. There was no way to solve it, right? Mm. There now is a way to solve it, but your heart only has so many electrical signals. Mm. <laughs> so... After that, I I started working with a therapist again, looking at a lot of mindfulness and meditation Mm. and stress management. Mm. And I I know I am not as productive as I used to be at all because I I shut off. Mm. And, you know, it also creates a different level of work ethic. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I will do this. Because I have to stop at this time. Mm. I have to get between seven and eight hours of sleep. I have to. Mm. I need to get up and exercise. I have to do that. It's this big mindset shift, which is really hard still now because it's like, oh, I could stay up another hour and do this and just get this. Mm -mm. I don't. Mm. And that's part of what caused me to think of, I actually want to have a partner in life. Mm. And so I found Matt, Mm -hmm. you know, and that was a very happy coincidence And he has been wonderful in so, so many ways, Mm. but a big piece is helping to check me and making certain I do shut off Mm. and I don't work until midnight or one just because nothing else is around and is quiet and I can get it done and be overly productive. And, Mm -hmm. and so it's, I wouldn't say there's one magic answer for how to do everything. It's just, okay, I know these are the priorities. Mm -hmm. Like I, I should have been done with my Warner education right now, but I put pause on it's like, I, I can't, I had to take a year off and then I back down to one course at a time. Mm-hmm. So it's cool. I'm still doing it. Yeah. So what if it takes double the amount of time? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's again, checking in with yourself, what really matters. Mm-hmm. And to me, my health is the most important thing yeah. because that stress, I didn't know would have that big of an impact on my body, but yeah. it does. And it does for all of us. It's, yeah. and I, obviously wasn't managing it in the right way. I I hope I am now, or at least on a better path. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really important for all of us to figure out is don't look at somebody else and say, oh, they're doing so much. I I, am not keeping up. Yeah. You have to look at what is right with you. Yeah what you want to be doing and what that means for managing it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that because I think, I think it is easy to read someone's bio and think, oh my gosh, they are doing everything and Mm -hmm. I'm not doing half of that. And where am I failing? And I think particularly in, in communities that are so high achieving like this, I feel like a lot of students at Eastman have, similar mentalities of like, I need to be go, go, go all the time. I have to practice eight hours a day. I have to, you know, skip lunch and do work and, you know, not take care of your health. Yeah. And because health can be the easy thing to let go of when you're like, I need to practice. I need to go to rehearsal. I need to study. So I think 
you know, hopefully, and obviously not everyone will have it get to the point right. that it did for you. I hope you don't let it get to yeah, the point. Yeah. But that was a huge wake up call. And it, and it's just a really important reminder because even if it doesn't get to that point, like you said, stress affects everyone so much. And musicians are already in very high stakes, competitive, stressful environments already. So I think all of these things you're talking about, about adding reflective time and Working on stress management is so important. I feel like that's a piece that isn't really addressed enough, even though it's such a prevalent <laughs> it's such a prevalent thing in our industry and every industry. Mental health and wellness mm-hmm. is huge. Mm-hmm. And I think each of us have to find our own way yeah. to navigate that, but it is so critically important. Yeah. Not just the physical health that you have, but your own mental health. Yeah. Yeah. And and for me, it's the mindfulness practice. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I sit here at lunch every day and close my door for 10 minutes after I eat and just have a bit of quiet time. I'm not looking at the screen. Mm-hmm. I go through my own little meditations. It just, it calms my blood pressure down. I can feel that difference. Could I have cranked out three more emails? Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what's the point of that? Yeah. You know, I can get the emails done. It'll be delayed. It, and, and I don't mean for any of my delays to upset someone. And I'm certain some of them have, because it's not the same productivity and time Mm -hmm. that it was before, but I'd like to think I'm working smarter than I was. And, and for every, that's different for everybody, Yeah, you know, that's different for everybody. But I think what can be shared is the intentionality with how mm-hmm. you approach managing your time and managing your priorities in a way that's healthy. Yeah. And I think it's like what you were saying before of that mindset shift, mm-hmm. because I think it's a lot to do with how you define productivity and how you think of what success is and all of that and just realizing that that rest is productive too and that success is more than just achieving all these things. Health is also successful and there's a lot more pieces into it than you might initially think. And I think that's hard to realize, especially as a younger student, I would feel I didn't really think about that when I was a student. Nope. I just thought about what I needed to achieve. Yeah. So I think, yeah, yeah, the more there can be done in spreading just that idea and that awareness is important. And that's, you know, I started talking about it a bit more Mm. just because of that. Yeah. It's especially in the age of social media where everything is so curated. Yeah. Right. And I love that in so many ways, but it can be very detrimental Mm -hmm. in other ways too. And, and how, how do you bring in that reality of what life is? And, and for me, another layer of it, you know, my dad died Mm -hmm. of a cardiac event on November 1st Mm -hmm. last year. I don't know exactly what that was, I don't know if it's genetics. Mm -hmm. I don't know if if that's part of the reason why I had the cardiac ablation. Mm -hmm. But I sat and had a long conversation with my cardiologist in July. And so I'm going to see her yearly from this point forward for Mm -hmm. the rest of my life. Just because of that, I think everybody should have (laughs) a mental coach. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should have a cardiologist too. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But you don't know how long you have. Yeah. You know, I talked to my dad on Halloween the night before and we FaceTime because me and Matt were out reverse trick or treating in the neighborhood and it was so sweet and so much fun. And I'm going to try not to cry. Mm. You just don't know how long you have. Yeah. And when I had that cardiac thing and then my dad had one that took his life, Mm -hmm. it just brings it into a very real perspective that life is really short. Yeah. You know, he was only 65 Mm -hmm. when he died. And, and so my mom and my sister and I have been trying to figure all of that out, you know, life without dad. And it's hard to believe it's almost a year now and Mm -hmm. just so many memories. I would talk, I still talk to my mom every day on Mm -hmm. the way to and from work. And, and I would talk, typically call one on the way and the other on the way home. And Mm I, I miss hearing my dad's voice. I miss talking to him, but you know, if, if anything good can come from his death, it's, it's really thinking about how, how do I continue this practice of, 
of balance, what does that mean for me? Because I, I know his was a cardiac event. I've already had a major one, mm-hmm. you know, and so I don't know if it's genetic or not, but I, for me, critically important to, to figure that out and to keep that going every day. Yeah. 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 And I think also, I was just thinking about how you mentioned that, you know, you're still working on your doctorate and you should have been done with it by now, but you're not because you're taking more time to do it. And, and I just think the idea is so relatable and so important to realize that, you know, you might be doing something and you might see the, the standard timeline of how long it takes and you might take longer. I took like six and a half years to finish my doctorate um, because I had to take some time off when my mom got breast cancer. Yeah. And life happens yeah. and there's more important things, family yeah. and health and all these things. And I just think realizing that and knowing that we're all on our own timelines. 150%. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I really, I really yeah. appreciate you sharing that and being vulnerable. And yeah. I just think that really will hit for a lot of people. Yeah. I just think it's not talked about enough, you know, and I don't, I have nothing to hide really, Mm -hmm. but I I just hope that it is helpful to someone listening to understand you can do it the way that you want, regardless Mm -hmm. of what anybody else says. It's your life, your definition of success, your goals that you want to achieve. And if no one has done that before, why not you Hmm. do it in the way that you want? You know, don't, don't try to be someone that you aren't. Yeah. Beautiful. I think that's a really perfect note to end on. I, I always finish my interviews with a quick rapid fire Q and a. Yep. So if you don't mind, yes, maybe just, just sort of lighten the mood. I know. I know. I took it too. No, no. (laughs) I think it's really important and I'm really glad you did because I think that's so meaningful and so important. So I'm really glad you did, but maybe we could just do a quick rapid fire. Yeah. So these are just top of mind, how you are feeling at the moment go. (laughs) Okay. Great. Okay. So who's your favorite composer? Yes. (laughs) I listen to the Bach cello suites almost every day. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I better go listen to those again. I love them Mm. so much. That's very good. That's very good kind of meditative. How would we say that word? Meditative. Medi- thank you. <laughs> Meditative and reflective kind yeah. of music to listen to. Yeah, there's Beautiful. something very comforting about yeah. those pieces mm. yes, that I love. I'm going to go listen to that later tonight. <laughs> How about your favorite piece of classical music, would you say? Right of Spring. Oh, very nice. Mm-hmm. Epic. When I got my new speaker system at home, <laughs> oh, I cranked it on all three levels. It was so fun. <laughs> That's yes. incredible. Yeah. Very good. You can't go wrong no. with that piece. No. How about your favorite movie? movie soundtrack mm. can I say Harry Potter of course you can <laughs> I just love all of those I mean there's so many great movie soundtracks mm. and if I had to say a second one I would say E.T. Actually, John Williams I know John Williams <laughs> right and I remember hearing the Boston Symphony mm. play that accompaniment with the movie going on yes. and Cindy Myers is the piccolo player uh. And that piece is basically a piccolo solo. It mm. begins and ends with that tritone, you know? Mm. Oh, I love it so much. So, so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely so magical. We were just watching one of the Fantastic Beasts movies yeah. the other week, and they still incorporate his themes into those movies. And every time it plays, it just takes me yeah. to a fantasy world. Yeah. It's just magical. What genre of music do you listen to most of the time? Oh, okay. So if you would have asked me before meeting Matt, Mm. I would have said classical music. Yeah. Since meeting Matt, he used to work in radio broadcasting. Oh, very cool. He's not a musician, but there was one time... You know, he, I, I just kept playing random things and he named them all straight for two hours, not classical, but like all different types of pop stuff. Wow. I'm like, Whoa. So since meeting him, we listen to all kinds of stuff, mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. Just variety. Variety. Very and cool. it's really fun to listen to it, classical music, some of it, jazz, uh, pop, indie, mm-hmm. you know, rap. He's introduced me to something yeah. and hip hop. I mean, wow. it's all over the place and it's really fun. There's some things that I'm like, yeah, 
I'm, I might not listen to that again. Yeah. But there's other things that is so creative mm. and fun. So that's been really fun. Mm. So I, that's my answer for that question. Opening your musical horizons. Yeah. I like it. And the inspirations that are drawn yeah. from all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What are you currently reading? What am I reading? Oh, books for school. That's what it's called. Oh, books for school. I was like, there's a book called books for school. No, no. Um, actual books, for actual school. books and readings and everything. So okay. that's what I'm digesting. But there's a book over here that mm. it's by Eric Booth. Oh, it's called making change, teaching artists and their role in shaping a better world. Mm. So this is on my list sometime this month. Cause I'm going to do a podcast interview with Eric about, <gasps> this book. Oh, wow. And I love his work. I love everything that he is doing with the teaching artist world. So this is the book book that I'm planning to read next mm. and highly recommend it. Nice. So. Uh, what was the last thing you listened to? Last thing that I listened to... Well, it was yesterday, Bach Cello Suites. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and then a musician you really admire? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, this is hard. It's a hard question. There's so many. Mm. There's so many. Okay, this may seem totally out of left field. I'm not saying I'm the biggest fan of her music, but I admire Taylor Swift <laughs> because of how she, at least on the surface, or what is shown in the media, how she represents standing up as an artist, mm. doing the right thing, yeah. leading in different ways in the music industry with such courage and with such grace. Mm. So there's so many other ways that I could have taken that, mm -hmm. but I decided to go for the odd one. <laughs> Not at all odd. I don't know if you know this about me. I am a Massive Swifty. No, I didn't know this. Massive That's Swifty, awesome. So yeah. I just made your day, you just didn't I? You completely <laughs> made my day. And I have, I could do a whole nother podcast episode about her. You have no idea. Oh, I can't <laughs> wait for it. Send it to me when you do it. But I just think, yeah. and I just read a news article this morning, you know, her tour that she's releasing live and has already made a hundred million dollars yeah. in pre-sales. Yeah. It's like, wow, I should I go was part that. of that. I got tickets the second they came out. I just, you know, what she's done with streaming, you know, how it was in the news, how she compensated her truck drivers and the other tour people. and It's just amazing. It is. It's yeah. really creative. And, you know, watching her re-record her mm -hmm. entire discography. Inspiring. So that she can have the rights to her music really highlights some of the big, big challenges in the music industry, mm -hmm. but the way that she's done it without smearing people yeah. just by standing up and, and doing it and getting it done in a way that protects her rights and her creativity. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. And something I've thought a lot about from watching the Airs tour, I don't know if you've watched it. Nope. Um, I did not go, but I've had some students that went yeah. and sent me photos when they were there. She does two surprise songs every show. I did know that. Yeah. yeah and, and and so she'll perform them. And part of her rules was if she messes up a surprise song, then it has the option of being played again. And so I feel like she's created this culture that is so, me as a classical musician, I go on stage and I'm like, if I mess up, it's the end of the world. Like, right. I cannot mess up. And she's somehow she's created this culture where everyone wants her to mess up. Yeah. Because if she messes up, she will maybe play the song again. And we yeah. want her to play the song again. Yeah. And I just think that attitude is so refreshing. Mm -hmm. So she's on stage, and if she messes up a song, she'll just laugh it off, and she'll be like, oh, guess I can do that song again. Yep. And everyone loves it. And yeah. I'm like, how did you just turn on its head the whole idea of, like, yeah. messing up on stage is the most mortifying thing to ever happen to me as a musician? It's pretty cool, huh? I don't know how she does it, yeah. but, yeah, that's just a small part of well, Anyways, <laughs> thank you so much for saying that answer. <laughs> I love it so much. Um, okay, I will try to contain myself <laughs> last rapid fire question if there was one book movie podcast resource you know article anything that you felt like you just really think someone should go check that out right now what would it be oh man so many things i 
would encourage people to listen to the Women at Work podcast by mm. Harvard Business Review. Okay. You know, I, I lead these salary negotiation sessions, have gotten interested in gender wage equity and other things. And that podcast I've been listening to for a couple years now. There's some really great historical ones as well as current ones that are coming out. Talks a lot about equity issues in the workplace um, for all genders, not just women. Mm. I find it fascinating and so inspiring to hear the research that they do. Sometimes it's picked up on the Harvard Business Review magazines. I read those. Sometimes that's a lot to digest. But the themes that they pick up in that podcast are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And on a light note, the other podcast that I love is The Office Ladies. I was going to say, there's so much office (laughs) stuff around this office. I walked in and I was like, oh. I love it. The Office Ladies podcast is really good. Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. Yeah. So those are my two go-to, and then I have a ton of other ones. But yeah, I feel like the women at work is not as well known, and so I like to talk about that one a lot. Perfect. Yeah. Amazing. I will link to everything. You've already said so much inspiring, helpful things. If there's any last sort of final piece of advice that you'd want to leave the listeners and then also if you could just end with where people could find you learn more about what you're doing here at Eastman the leadership program all of that if you could just end with that sure so if it's one last piece of advice I would say actually two things Mm. one is that you're never alone Mm. there's always a community out there right? And if you don't know where to go, call me. (laughs) I'll help be a first step in that, Mm -hmm. right? You're never alone. And the second piece of advice is to really take the time to figure out who you are and what you want. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that you can show up as your authentic self in any community that you are in, Mm -hmm. you know? So those are my two pieces of advice. And you can find me at Eastman School of Music, 25 Gibbs Street. No. <laughs> um, yeah, if you, esm.rochester.edu mm-hmm. backslash, I think it's IML. Mm. I should know this. That's I'll link really bad. To it. You'll I'll link, link to it. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you can find out more about the work, uh, everything that we have to offer here in IML. Mm-hmm. You can always find me on LinkedIn mm-hmm. or on Facebook. Um, not always the best with all the other social medias, but those two I'm I'm on quite a bit. And, you know, stop by and see me at Eastman when you're in Rochester or you decide to take a trip to Niagara Falls or something. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really really appreciate all the time and all of your wisdom. I know people will get a lot out of this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Orchestrating Your Career podcast. And a big thank you to Rachel for sharing her musical journey along with so much wisdom and advice. The resources mentioned in this episode and where you can connect with Rachel and all the work she's involved in at Eastman are all linked below. You can find the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms, as well as get more frequent updates on Instagram. To watch videos of all the episodes and get extra behind-the-scenes content, check out the YouTube channel Orchestrating Your Career. In fact, look out for another behind-the-scenes video coming to the channel, with Rachel showing us around the Institute of Music Leadership's office at Eastman. Subscribe so you don't miss that and more upcoming videos. Share this episode with a musician or anyone else you think might be interested. And look out for new episodes on the 1st and 15th of every month. Next episode's conversation will be with Carrie Davids Morris, a violist who also went to the Eastman School of Music and then got her master's from the Manhattan School of Music before returning back to Rochester to work as a freelance musician and as a hairstylist and curl specialist. Her story has so many unexpected twists and turns. See how Carrie navigates them with courage and resilience on February 1st's episode. Until next time, here's Rachel's performance with the SMR Trio. Rachel, Sarah, and Micah, take it away.